James, if you want to go ahead and get going, I think we'd all appreciate it. You bet, you bet. Well, everybody, take a look at the agenda. This is, these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about, a little bit about CIW, and then some of the classic language structures and constructs that you need to know, programming models and some life cycle information. Talk a bit about how project management is done in web development, some licensing models, mobile application development essentials and what it means to develop for desktops and servers and, and then some discussion about what it's like to move into actual programming languages. The whole idea behind this webcast, folks, is within an hour to give you a background because if you into the web development and what happens. Because if you're right now a designer, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Congratulations that you've been working in CIW web design but it's important to take a look at what it means to move on into development. When you say, Stephen, I mean, that's kind of a, the right cocktail for career success, isn't it, having design and development all at the same time? More and more, James, more and more, the industry is looking in that general direction. You know, given uh, what the web has to offer, uh, development is a, is a logical path for a designer to, to, to move towards. So these are things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so we're brought to you today by CIW, the Skills-Based Education Standard. We bring a holistic approach to, to certification. We, taught, we provide courses and certification exams that teach the Internet, SEO, social media, web design, and, of course, development. And we put people on a lifelong learning path. We're vendor neutral. We use open source material as well as proprietary development uh, tools. And we focus on job role-based uh, approach to education and job competencies so that those skills you learn are going to be applied for the rest of your life. That's why we're globally accepted. So I'm James Sanger. I'm uh, president and chief certification architect of uh, the company. And I've worked for, for years in the certification and also in the security world and other areas. Stephen Schneider, our fellow co-host here, I'm glad to have you here, Stephen, um, is our certification specialist, is an expert author and educator, has uh, written a book, for example, uh, at least contributed to a book, uh, LPI Linux in a Nutshell, uh, has designed certifications in courseware. And if you want to follow what Stephen's up to, you can go up to Twitter and you can get Twitter pated with him there uh, at CIW <laughs> underscore instructor. Yeah. Is, that, is, is that fair enough to say, Stephen? Or? <laughs> yes, or, or, or yes, that that will work. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> let you in on on what we're up to. <laughs> you bet. And and there's some a lot of exciting things that we've been uh, that we have been up to. Well, why are we here today? The reason why we're here, folks, is because. Again, you may already be a web designer, and, and that's terrific and great, but what the world really needs is web developers. And, and at CIW, we do more than just create web designers. And, and as a web designer, I think the first thing to think about, as a web developer, the first thing to think about is you need to know the whole Internet. And Stephen, you and I have often talked about this, and that's one reason why we've designed CIW Foundations the way we did. But as a developer, it's more than just picking a language and running with it. You need to know the whole internet. You know what I'm trying to say here. I do very much so. It it it's it's all about you know the diversity of of being able to design the sites and being able to speak the language. Yeah. It it's cross sectional really. Cross sectional is a good term because you need to know the web. You need to know design principles, but also programming concepts that we'll be talking about in just a second here. Also about security, how the internet, all the pieces work together. And Stephen, you and I have often talked to people about understanding how everything works. So as a developer, you're going to need to know protocols such as HTTP. You'll also need to understand how even IP works and networking works. So all of these elements work together. And by by joining an elite group, if you want to be part of an elite group of developers, you need to understand the whole Internet. And that's more than just design. That's more than just development. It's even project management. So your goal is the designer developer, the designer slash developer, as it were. And uh, you'll notice that a, a web developer and a web designer, and Stephen, I think this is really, uh, I, I put this together here uh, real quick, but I wanted to show how even though many people will see things as, uh, these two skills as separate. 
they overlap constantly. And, and I think there's more areas of overlap than just HTML5 and CSS3 and, and JavaScript. There are other areas that I wanted to put this in some sort of graphical form or, or spatial form so people understand that as a web developer and a designer, there are a lot of skills that everybody needs to know. I like this slide, James. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to steal it. I mean, borrow it, um, and because it, it it does show that overlap, uh, and and in a lot of skill sets. When you talk about web designers, uh, you know the, the the term web developer gets gets you know used as almost synonymous with it, and and they really are different. But there is a sufficient amount of overlap in there, and I think that does a very good job of illustrating. And so because HTML5, you have that, what we in CIW Foundations anyway, we'll call the HTML5 trifecta, where you basically have HTML5, uh, uh, you have CSS3, and then JavaScript working together. So as a developer, uh, or as a designer, you are naturally gravitating towards doing some form of programming. And, and the programming isn't really in HTML5 and CSS3, these are not really languages. But you get into JavaScript, uh, and, and you're moving towards that programming world. And uh, so as you understand what it means as a web designer, and, and we teach this very, very well, that as you create video, work with graphics, choose the right fonts, the typography, as you make your pages accessible, you are going to be working with developers. And eventually, you're going to start borrowing and lifting the skills that they have. That's just a natural thing. And you're going to pick some sort of language. Might be PHP, which I've listed twice for some reason, probably because it's the top one out there. There's Python. There's Java. There's .NET. All sorts of platforms that we can use. We're going to take a look at these. But before we go stampeding into saying, well, pick this as the most important language or the most popular one, we're going to take a look at that's some of the things that every programmer needs to know, no matter what language you choose. And the reason we're taking this, this step here is basically I've noticed in working with programmers, no matter how young or old they are, they learned certain constructs in languages that in a lot of cases aren't really used as much anymore. I remember talking to somebody about uh, what it meant to declare variables. And I said, well, you know, what was the first way that you did this? And I said, well, I I learned that in using Fortran. And another person said in using Lisp. These are programming languages. They're not particularly web-oriented. And I said, well, so how did you learn? And this is a long time ago. I said, how did you learn to declare variables in, say, PHP? And I said, well, once I learned the concept, all I had to do was just apply the concept to a specific language. And now I can work with multiple languages. And you'll find, as a web developer, you are going to use the right tool for the right job. There are times when Perl is great for data extraction. PHP is fantastic for making sites work together with databases. You may find yourself in a Microsoft shop. So .NET uh, languages such as C Sharp will become very important. Or you may want to work with Adobe and do some really cool graphical kinds of things. And that's where Flex comes in. So it's all about choosing the right language for the right job, but it's also getting foundational skills that will help you. Well, for a second, Stephen, I put together this little slide here. And you'll notice there's a really lame looking picture on the, so on the side there. This lame picture is actually really quite good data. I got it from a website that, uh, that I, I consider to be pr pretty authoritative in its understanding of what the popular server side programming languages are. So this graphic is meant to show which is in considered important by the community, what's in use. So I, I went to a couple of sites to get uh, these together. I went to TechCrunch, and I also to W3Techs.com. They do a pretty good job of showing what some of the uh, top languages are out there. You'll notice Java it remains a popular one. I think that's just because it has such a large install base. Perl, ColdFusion, even ASP.NET uh, is in there. In this particular one, PHP was a bit lower. I found that surprising because I find PHP to be the one that most people, especially beginning, uh, will try to get into. Uh, what are your thoughts, Stephen, about some of the languages that you've been hearing about that are the hot ones today? The James, that's an interesting question because definitely yeah. you hear a lot about PHP. 
Uh, it's, it's one of those hot terms that's out there, using PHP with database integration. But there's also, you know, a, a real heavy um, uh, initiative in, in the .NET environment, in, in Microsoft yeah. platforms. Uh, and it really depends on the type of application that a particular company is, is putting together and where their expertise is. Um, and, and you bring up a good point about um, uh, Java uh, being uh, popular as well. Uh, Cold Fusion, that's interesting to see Cold Fusion on that list. I haven't really heard much about Cold Fusion in, in a number yeah. of years, actually. But the technology kind of is still out there. there. Right. Yes. It is. It is. And I think there's some reasons why Java remains popular, a couple of things. First of all, uh, Android development, you know, creating of apps, which isn't necessarily pure web, but I, I kind of lump them together with app development and web. Uh, Android prefers Java. Uh, in the same way that iOS will will prefer linear C, so I think that's one reason why Java has taken a bit of a jump there. So there are these languages here, but again, before we we stampede into saying, well, learn a particular language, I think it's time to step back and understand that as developers, you are creating content and you can license that in various ways. And as a developer, you have some choices about the kinds of models that you can use. Now, if you're working for uh, a, a typical for-profit company, and I say typical, uh, I don't know if that's quite fair, but let's put it this way. A lot of companies will use a proprietary licensing model, and they do a very good job at creating high-quality code and high-quality uh, interfaces with a proprietary license, Cisco. Microsoft and others, they will use a, a licensing model, and basically based on a EULA, and by that I mean an end user license agreement, the EULA. This is traditional copyright, and it's designed to protect intellectual property. You know, Stephen, I, I've noticed, and, and, and as you talk with instructors and, and, our, uh, and, and experts out in the world, what kind of discussions do you find where people talk about proprietary versus open source? kind of licensing. You know, we all, I think, know what the EULA is, or, or whenever you install a, uh, an application, let's say, from Microsoft, there is a licensing agreement. You can't go any further unless you accept it. And, and very few people really read, or, or, or even if they do read them, they don't particularly understand what those license agreements are. They just want the software to work. But the reason why these end user licensing agreements work is because companies feel they're like, uh, programmers are expensive. And, and the software is important, and it, we have to protect it. But what are some of the things that you've found out, out, out in the world, Steve, and when it comes to proprietary versus open source types of licenses, which we'll, I have a slide on that next, in the next slide. But what have you found out there? I found that a lot of people are interested in moving more towards, at least to me, uh, more towards the open source. It's easier to, it's easier to implement. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's easier to, um, especially in a small business platform, um, uh, you know, to adopt more of a model of, of, for instance, going with PHP, MySQL, than than more of a proprietary format, um, such as in, in in Oracle or even in in um, uh, Microsoft SQL uh, and, right. and database. You know, with Microsoft, uh, you have a .NET platform, and uh, you you have it kind of lends itself. You, you you can open source anything that you develop, no matter what platform. But if you're using proprietary uh, infrastructures like .NET, it's it's probably more natural that you're going to be following a, a proprietary development method. Um, and with a EULA, there's there's certain limited uses that you have. In other words, you're keeping the key, the secret, the code secret. And you're doing this because you want to allow this material to only be used under certain conditions. And if those conditions are violated, you can take back the software. Um, of course, the proprietary model can be extremely profitable. The open source model, instead of using copyright, uh, some smart alecks out there have called it for years, and I think accurately, copy left. The idea is that instead of keeping the code secret, it must remain in the public domain. And as a programmer, you will have a choice. Um, if you're creating your own material or your company that you work for will have a choice. We're going to license it according to a proprietary model or according to open source. If it's open source, the code that you create must remain in the public domain. It can be reused and added upon by anyone as long as they keep it 
uh, public. And so there are two different models, and they're both very powerful. I tend to gravitate more towards the open source model, but you can't discount the power of more proprietary models. And I think as a programmer, it's going to be, and as a web developer, it will be important for you to understand the power of each. With open source development models, there's the old saying, uh, what is it? Uh, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. That's the phrase. With many eyes, all bugs are shallow. In other words, as Stephen, you create content, as you create code, and everybody starts reviewing it, they'll see how elegant your code is and then improve upon it, or they'll find a problem and then improve it. And this is the exciting thing, is that instead of a, a team of 200 developers, you have a team of 200,000 or more developers looking at it. And that's one of the exciting things, and it creates a code base that anybody can access. What are examples of open source licenses? Oh, go ahead, Stephen. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that the, the crowdsourcing model uh, works wonders, right? When you can, we can have a lot of heads right. working on a similar problem to to resolve it, and to to uh, it also can speed up development time as well, can it not? Uh, to where you've you've got a product, you yeah. have a lot of contributors in there to it that can that can get a product put out in less time. Uh, possibly uh, than than what it would take uh, a single person working on a proprietary model. That's right, and uh, you also can uh, divest your work off with other people. And as long as you organize it correctly, using some of the proprietary, excuse me, some of the uh, uh, development models that we're going to get into here in just a couple of minutes, you can do exactly that, Stephen. That's a great point. Now there are a lot of open source models out there. There's the uh, GNU GPL. Uh, that's the most common one that people at least know. But there's the Apache license, the FreeBSD license, uh, the Artistic license. There's even one, I'm not kidding, called the Free Beer license, uh, which uh, has a, a more of a, uh, I should say, a constraint on it. Stephen, this is where if, uh, if you create some code according to the Free Beer license, the license explicitly states that, yeah, it stays in the public domain, but if, um, if you come across somebody that uses your code, uh, they owe you a beer. That's the that free beer. That works for me. Right? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it wouldn't work for me so much, but yeah, congratulations <laughs> to you. Go get them. Uh, uh, <laughs> I once talked with a, a friend of mine over at IBM who said that there was a really good piece of software that they, that they wanted to use at IBM, but the lawyers wouldn't let them because that, con that constituted a, an obligation that IBM wasn't ready to fulfill. How about that? So uh, so these are examples. And the GNU public, uh, the GPL, is in several different versions. The latest version is 3.0. But as a developer, you would have a choice, or your company would have a choice, of choosing 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0, depending on what you want, want to use. Well, let's talk about how software is developed. So we can talk about, we've already talked about how you can license it, but there are all, all sorts of ways in which code is created. And it's not just the lone wolf out there who creates code. I, I think, Stephen, uh, one thing I've noticed is as you talk with students and, and, and people who are just getting started, they have kind of a, the rugged individualist idea of what it means to be a coder. And, and by that, somebody who's working in isolation somebody who does brilliant things and then presents it to the world, and the world goes, ooh, and ah. Um, and then That's right. They do their best work cool. in the middle of the night in a dark room with uh, several computers around them, and, and they just, they just uh, code all the time. Yeah, a highly caffeinated, isolated environment. I think, right? right? I right. mean, isn't that the classic model? And there are permutations of that. Your typical hacker is somebody who works in isolation and all that. Well, actually, I mean, have you found that to be the case? Because I've noticed it. It's actually far from, from the case when it comes to being uh, how programmers actually work. There's, there, there's a, a definitely a trend towards, you know, more of the isolated type. But, you know, the way that the industry is evolving, you know, that stereotype is having to be withdrawn and, and, and people are, are need to be engaged. Uh, and, and, and working with others uh, in a collaborative environment. When I first started working as a, pro, as a, as a program, and this was a long time ago, and I, and I moved away from programming fairly quickly, but I, I remember um, uh, my, uh, I, getting a phone call uh, from my wife who informed me over the phone that she was pregnant for the third time that we were going to have another kid. And I'm telling this story simply because 
I'm like, wow, you know, and we were talking about it, and I hung up the phone, and a programmer I was working with, he was in the cubicle with me, and we were literally working elbow to elbow, and he's like, well, that sounds like interesting news, and I told him about it. The reason I tell you this story is because we were working literally elbow to elbow, working on, at the time, it was a VB script, uh, really JavaScript, uh, kind of a JavaScript application, working on it, and, and as I think about that example, uh, there were several others that we were working with at the time, and what we were doing is coding at the time, but before then, we had had several meetings working with, I'll call them stakeholders, uh, people who were members of, uh, who worked for the company, and, and we had several meetings talking with them. We also went out and talked with a few other stakeholders who were actual clients of the company to make sure that we understood exactly what they were looking for. So yeah, there were a lot of highly caffeinated nights where I was working alone, helping to create the code at the right place. But early on, especially, I was working elbow to elbow with people, helping get information from stakeholders to get buy-in, to work with them and understand it. Right now, Stephen, I'm, I'm uh, uh, in working with our uh, web team, for example. Uh, that's what we're doing, is that they've reached out making sure they get buy-in from all of the major stakeholders, all the, the company bigwigs, all of the really important people like the salespeople and marketing to get buy-in, to get an understanding and gather input. This way, they can say, well, here's what the project is. Here are the business needs and the goals. So I, I think that the idea of the programmer as a rugged uh, um, individualist has application. It's important. There are times when you just have to get down and start coding. But I think there are also a lot of times where it's a much more social environment than we realize, and or than most people think. And uh, and so I think uh, as a developer, again, you've got to work with stakeholders, gather input, and then you have to prioritize. All of these things are not necessarily things that you do as an individual. And I think that's a really important concept to understand. Well, there are various development models and philosophies, and, and these are all how should I say it? People are very passionate about these types of things. People will say, well, waterfall is ridiculous, or agile is the only way, or vice versa. Uh, but I think it's important as, a, as a, somebody who's moving into the developer, developer world to understand the different types of philosophies and models that are out there. And again, the rugged individualist or the cowboy coder, right? Uh, these are phrases that are often used. Um, it's important to avoid that kind of issue and so there are ways in which teams can work together. And you'll notice, uh, whether it be people at Microsoft or working for Canonical, the people who create Ubuntu Linux, there are entire teams of hundreds, even thousands of people who work together on uh, parts of code that they're responsible for. And the same thing is applicable to people who work on mobile apps or web, developer, uh, well, or web um, applications. So one of the tools uh, or methods is called Waterfall. And it's a, a coding framework. It is a very sequential way of approaching uh, of, of approaching development. And if you look at the little graphic here that I stuck in here, it's basically where there are steps involved. Where first you you gra gather requirements, you design it, you implement, you verify that it was right, and then you maintain the code. It's very linear in the sense that once you've gotten the requirements, you don't go back and mess with it anymore. Well, we've got the requirement doc for this web app that we're going to create using whatever language. And then now we're going to go and design it. Now we're going to code it, implement it, and get it going, and then verify that it works and maintain it. It's kind of a cool little model, um, at least theoretically, because every step is discrete. And it's uh, something where you're like, well, we're done with the requirements section. Now we're moving on. The requirement ship has failed, and now we're into design. It's something that is very nice. We'll talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses here in a second. Well, there's another uh, development model that's actually kind of an opposite of the waterfall method. And waterfall, by the way, is called waterfall because think of it as a cascading waterfall of steps. And once the water has moved from one step or one part of the waterfall downstream, it doesn't go back up again. Well, agile is a different philosophy altogether. And, and I'm not really going to say one's better than the other. I do have my opinion. Uh, but everything has its own application. Uh, and I think that's a pun intended there. But agile is much more iterative. 
And by iterative, that means that as you gather requirements and as you find information from your customers or your stakeholders or whomever, you, you get that information, but you also, during the coding process itself, will actually go back to the customer at times and, and ask for more input and, and ask for verification of what you have created by iterative. Then each step is not only step by step and linear, but it's actually a little circular because you'll go back and say, this is what I've done. Is this what you want? And then those things can change depending on how stakeholders provide input. You also, with Agile, will have uh, teams that will work together and they are cross-functional, meaning that you'll have designers working with coders, uh, and people who are stronger with, in design will also work with people who are stronger in coding, but you'll also have people in marketing and sales contributing. So it's a much more flexible response to change because you're, you're touching the customer or the stakeholder much more often. And examples of Agile-based development are extreme and Scrum and also Lean or what's called LSD types of environments. So if you run across things like that, names like that, those are agile types of environments. So Stephen, I think what you can see here is there are kind of two opposing philosophies. Uh, waterfall, some people will, will argue, uh, it was created according to the manufacturing kind of model, like Ford making cars as opposed to a web developer making an application. And what might work for making cars, Stephen, right, may not work as well for developing software. The requirements are different, and the whole process of doing so is different. And that's where Agile uh, comes into play. I think really, James, it comes into it comes into play as far as what it is that you're actually develop, developing, and and for the yeah. environment uh, that it's in. Uh, given, for instance, if you're looking at a lot of uh, today's web applications. Um, or, or applications in general, um, you know, you're you're trying to meet the needs of the stakeholders, and so you know the agile model uh, definitely you know has has a play. Uh, whereas if you were just following the waterfall model, it might come back to haunt you uh, later on, where you could probably yeah, reach, because it's uh, like you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, you're right. I, I agree with what you what you're saying there. I, I was just saying, you know, it, it might cause you less hassle uh, in the long run. Um, and I did notice a comment in the in the chat box uh, just while you were, were talking there and giving the summary about scope creep uh, in the agile model. And yes, you know, scope creep can become a problem in in the agile uh, model. But it's that's when you know the programmer or, or the development team also has to have you know good project management. Uh, and, and project management leadership, you know, to, to come in and say, you know, okay, this is our statement of work, and this is where we need to manage scope creep uh, as, as we're going through the overall process. Great way to put it. See, with Waterfall, you develop the scope, and then you say, here's what it is, and then you never stray from it. Even, to put an extreme example, uh, or to put a, an example that is uh, possibly unusual, even if the customer says, well, actually, I want it to be a little bit different. You'd say, well, that's not what we agreed to six months ago when we were coding. So waterfall can seem very um, inflexible, even though uh, the milestones are well-defined and people know what's required of them. And, and it's a way of focusing on quality code. That's great, but see, with the weaknesses, as you're saying, it's not iterative. Um, it assumes that customers won't change their mind is probably a bad way to put it, that customers won't um, have additional requirements. You can also get a sense of false progress because if you follow the steps, getting the job done, you say, well, look at that. We Another hard day, we, we followed the steps. But at the end of the coding process, like you said, there's kind of a headache, Stephen, where oh, this isn't really what we wanted. Our, our needs have changed a little bit. Um, before we get into additional models, I want to address right away what you said about how, uh, or the comment about agile and scope creep. Uh, scope creep, folks, is basically where through a series of very small changes, uh, and they seem innocuous and proper and all that, you actually end up creating something radically different than what you started with. And the, the whole key with agile is everybody has to make sure that they're the overall vision is very strong, and then that does not stray with it. And that way, through the iterative process, the vision remains, or the scope remains the same, uh, even though uh, certain uh, changes are made within the scope. And that's where, you, like you said, Stephen, you have, a, you have to have a very good, knowledgeable pro, uh, uh, product manager and project leader uh, who basically says that's within the scope or not within the scope. 
uh, and that's very critical. And that product manager uh, sometimes is an expert programmer. It doesn't necessarily have to be. It just has to be a very savvy person who understands the implications of multiple, many little decisions. So great point, great point. Well, there are additional models out there. There's the rapid application development model, or the RAD model. There's the rational model, or the rational unified process model. And, and these tend to be iterative models as well. With, with RAD, there's minimal planning that happens, and then you start prototyping your application as you go along. And it, it, it depends upon having a very talented team and also a very well-defined goal. I've, I've noticed that that model <clears throat> excuse me, is very effective um, if, you're, if, if requirements can change and, and everybody's a bit more flexible. And for short term, I think rapid is very good. Uh, the rational unified process is very good because you're tailoring your steps uh, depending upon the talent of your team. Uh, you have to verify quality constantly, and change control is very critical. Another one is the open unified process. But to get into the strengths of RAD is that you're involving the stakeholders right up front. You're, you're, getting time, you're spending time capturing information about the actual needs. And then the, the development steps are based on what your business currently wants. And you spend less time documenting uh, progress and more on the code itself. Uh, one of the weaknesses, of course, is that if you don't document properly, nobody knows what's happened. <laughs> and, and you can end up with uh, some real confusion here. Um, so um, you also can uh, run into issues, uh, again, with confusion. And, and it's kind of hard to tell, well, wh are we at closure? Have we, really, have we really finished this product or not? And you can get into a lot of issues there where you know half the team agrees that we're done and half the team uh, agrees we're not done or the stakeholders say well we aren't done another issue that you can have happen is customers can get tired of having to talk to the uh, development team all of the time it's like didn't we already talk about this or um, do we really have to go into all this detail so you can get a lot of burnout factor there uh, when it comes to rad so it makes sense to use rad for example when the product when the requirements are well known, the stakeholders really are committed, and development can be put into individual pieces. And there are a lot of uh, additional uh, uh, models to think about. I'm going to keep going on here. When it comes to iterative uh, development, it's really strong because you can. It's really useful because you can deliver a product with initial functionality in a faster way. And you can focus on the most important elements of a web application or a mobile application faster. And each release delivers an operational product. Uh, there's also kind of a divide and conquer method, where one team can work on one element of an application, and another can work on uh, uh, another important element. And then uh, because you're constantly working with your stakeholders, uh, you basically have, uh, if requirements change, you can go back and resolve various issues. So uh, design and planning are paramount. The project leaders have to really understand exactly what that vision is. Uh, and increments have to fulfill the overall vision. And the total cost of the complete system isn't really lower. So that's a strength. But there's also some weaknesses involved there as well. Extreme programming is a form of agile method. I mentioned it earlier. It's really good for medium-sized teams. Uh, and it uses something called pair programming. I've, I've done this. Pair programming meaning two people or more uh, will work together on code. And you focus on the code. And the communication is not so much documented outside by project managers or what have you. It tends to be co communicated by the code or within the code if you anno uh, in annotated code yourself. This assumes one of the weaknesses of extreme is that it assumes that the pair is always able to work together at all times. What if one person is on a different area code, a radically different uh, time zone, I should say? What if somebody gets sick, uh, takes vacations, or what have you? There's one issue. You also have to constantly refactor the code. And some people will see refactoring as a good thing because you're making it better. Other people with more linear mindsets, uh, executives, will often see that as simply repeating work and not really making true progress. So those are some models that you will run into as a developer, and it's important for you to understand. Well, let's talk about some of the classic constructs and some of the classic things that every program language has. So Stephen, let's talk about variables, loops, and statements. 
Um, you, what, what, what a variable is, it's an area of memory, and you're basically putting a value into that. You declare it, and then you can use that variable throughout the program. A loop is something that will execute repeatedly upon a particular, usually on a particular set of conditions. In other words, uh, whenever Stephen clicks on the mouse, a certain loop will happen until he lets go of the mouse or something like that. So, and usually a loop will also execute a certain number of times and then stop. There are various kinds of statements that are made. If something happens, then do this. Or while something is occurring, do X. Or do something while something is happening. So these are the, the kinds of constructs that happen in no matter what programming language uh, you're using. And these are things that from a 50,000 foot view you should understand. And we'll have some examples uh, coming up here uh, shortly. Additional examples have to do with, uh, with, with classes and understanding what it means to have an object-oriented language. So what you have are classes that can create an object. And a, an object is simply an area of code that uh, defines a very important piece of functionality inside of an application. And with an object in an object-oriented programming language, such as PHP or Java uh, or C, uh, C, excuse me, C Sharp, these are things that you can create, and then reuse them. And you can also, in addition to reusing these things, you can manipulate certain properties of an object. So if you think of a pencil, for example, there are certain properties that a pencil might have. And I'm not necessarily talking about elements like the eraser, but it's like you can hold the pencil horizontally or vertically, or it has certain sides to it. And these are things that, with an object, as a programmer, you can mess with that object and reuse it. This means that you can create something once and reuse it many times. This makes it uh, your code, or can make your code very elegant and, uh, and, and uh, uh, to operate much faster. So classes are an important concept. There are expressions. An expression is basically a combination of symbols or, or text really that represents a particular value. It has to follow certain rules, and there are legal and illegal uh, uh, expressions out there. And then there are conditionals. And conditionals are used to test whether your expressions are legal or whether they're going to work or not. So additional concepts include things like data types. Uh, as a programmer, you're going to be receiving, especially a web-oriented programmer, you're going to be receiving input from end users all of the time, from customers. I mean, that's the nature today of the web. It, it really always has been. Uh, as designers, I think we tend to start thinking in terms of, well, I created that cool page that will then get viewed by millions of people or thousands of people. Isn't that cool? But the real value of the web is the ability to take input from people and then do creative things with that input. You know, Stephen, that's what we do, for example, with Twitter, isn't it? Uh, the whole idea is that we take information from people and then we put it into a database or, or what have you, and then we manipulate it. I mean, isn't that really the, the critical concept as a developer that people really need to understand? Bring information in, be able to categorize it, process it, and distribute it. Mm -hmm. See, and part of that processing and part of that distribution means that you're going to have to figure out what data type is coming in. Is it a number? Is it an integer? Uh, is it single characters? And so as a programmer, you have to declare how that is work and uh, what, what's coming on in. And if you declare it improperly, then you won't be able to use the data at all, or at least not properly. So you're going to be declaring all sorts of data types and working with all sorts of different types of data. There are conditionals, the code statements that <clears throat> excuse me, execute only if certain conditions occur. There are things called arrays, which is a, a type of variable that contains a list excuse me, a list of particular values. Um, and then, of course, there are objects we talked about in terms of classes. So let's take a look at some examples of your uh, typical uh, statements here. This here is an if-then statement. If something happens, and this happens to be Java code, but don't worry about that. You'll find JavaScript, which has nothing to do with Java at all, really. They're just completely separate <clears throat> things. Uh, this happens to be a piece of Java code. And it's basically saying, 
uh, with the void statement, we're starting a program. So here is a particular statement. Apply the brakes, right? And the car has to be moving. So if the car is moving, right, then the current, then you decrease the current speed. It will happen. Okay. So if the, you apply the brakes, current speed will be rem, will be reduced. And that dash dash it means reduced. You'll notice a couple of things about this code. First of all, notice how it's nicely annotated. It's not only nicely annotated for this webcast, but as a developer, you always will find good ways to annotate your code so that as I do something, and then Stephen uh, starts working with me on it, and I <clears throat> am uh, unavailable for some reason, does Stephen know what I've been doing? Does he know what I've been on about? And uh, that's very helpful. But notice that this is an if statement that basically says if one thing happens, then something will happen as a logical result. Well, there's also other many other statements like if, then, and else. So if you apply the brakes, if it's moving, you decrement or reduce the current speed. Um, or in certain, uh, if another condition has happened, it may be that you as a programmer will anticipate, well, there's no need to hit the brakes because the car has already stopped. In a, a certain program, it might crash or operate in an unpredictable or a negative way if you don't put in some sort of else statement saying, well, look, if it's already stopped, then you can do something else. So it's this kind of approach to programming that as a beginning programmer, you need to understand some of these common statements. I can't list them all here in a, in a one-hour webcast, but you can go out now and do some research about different types of statements there. Here's an example of a uh, statement while a, demo, uh, a demonstration is happening. Um, something will happen where an incremental counting will happen during a demonstration. It's a while statement. So while a particular demo is happening, you have a count taking place. There's the do while statement that will basically say uh, uh, not only uh, will counting occur, but it will all, all, all happen underneath a count of 11. Here's an example of an array. This happens to be a JavaScript array, not a Java, but a JavaScript array, where I basically said, here is a variable of my kayaks. And now, not only is it just one kayak, it's my kayaks. And then I've listed three of the kayaks that I have. In one case, I have a, uh, an NDK Explorer. I have an Eddyline kayak and one made, made by Necky. This list allows you to declare a variable and then declare and then use elements of a variable, at least three of uh, at least three of them. Notice uh, one thing that it's a zero-based count. All variables are zero-based. They start with zero. Uh, as humans, we tend to start with one. Computers start with zero. These are things that you'll need to understand. Uh, here's a JavaScript variable <coughs> that is used in a body of a, a very simple HTML5 text. Notice you've got your doc type, you've got a script being declared. There's the variable kayak. And the kayak name is that NBKC Kayaking UK little name there. And then you can write the kayak name out uh, uh, using the document dot write uh, <coughs> functionality of JavaScript. Uh, and then you can actually take that variable and then mess around with it. You can actually give it a name, call it Explorer. And then that will display out on the page. So these are examples of variables. Now this is just a JavaScript uh, example, but you'll find that each language has its own way of declaring variables. Perl works one way, PHP, another, JavaScript. But as you, a, a beginning developer, these are the concepts you'll have to understand. One thing that you'll find when it comes to programming is people will talk about sequential applications and multi-threaded applications. A sequential application is much more traditional. It uses one processor. Um, it basically, a programmer will specify the flow. So a programmer will do that. You test it in a very linear way, much like HTML validation. If you've ever validated an HTML or even HTML5 uh, piece of code uh, or JavaScript, done some debugging there, it's very linear. Uh, so to find a problem, you look, you trace the code, and you look for the failure. You, you identify it, and you fix it. Well, let's take a look at multi-threaded applications. It's much more challenging because now it's non-deterministic, meaning that instead of the programmer determining how it works, the language itself and some of the constructs inside of the language itself actually help specify flow. And as a result, it's a much more um, complex application. Also, 
a multi-threaded application can take care uh, can work with multiple processes, which are found in servers all over the place. Applications have to undergo real-time testing as a result of these non-deterministic behavior and as a result of working with multiple processes. Sometimes it's a bit of guesswork, and you have to uh, uh, be a bit more creative in your debugging. Uh, these are things to think about as programmers and concepts that you will come across. As a mobile developer, uh, you understand as a developer, you'll be working in various platforms, servers, desktops, but also working with mobile uh, systems. You'll be using, if you're working solely on iOS, you'll be using a language called Objective-C and with development applications provided by Apple. And I've listed the Development Center URL so you can do some more research uh, on that. Android, generally, you can use lots of languages, but Java is the one that they tend to uh, settle to. Uh, but you can also use HTML5. Uh, Sencha Touch is a fantastic little framework that allows you to create really cool HTML5. Um, it's not a free development environment, but it's one that's very, very useful nevertheless. And with JavaScript, you can use jQuery Mobile, which is a very fancy framework in JavaScript that has ready-made libraries that allow you as a programmer to reuse content and um, to uh, make decisions and make code much quicker than creating it out of whole cloth every time. So you will need to <clears throat> choose and use certain frameworks as a mobile developer. And the, there are others uh, here, but these are some of the biggies that you'll want to take a look at. You know, Stephen, I think one thing that we tend to think about when it comes to programmers is, again, well, they just want to go in and code there. But I think that the, the successful programmers that I've talked with, they are always thinking about what users are doing. Would you, would you agree to that? Or, or do you really see successful programmers as, as, you know, no, they're just really good at coding and other people will worry about what users want? This is a, a philosophical question, and, you know, I've, I've heard good arguments both ways. But what do you think? No, you're typically you're you're from what I have encountered, your better developers are going to be in tune with with what the audience is using. It's going to be developing towards them, uh, and that's what that's what makes it. You know, the the really as you were referring to it earlier, the day of the cowboy programmers is is really going away because uh, we are trying to meet the needs of our target audience. Uh, what platform is our target audience using? You know what. What are they interested in doing? Mm -hmm. And I think that the more that a programmer uh, can get past that kind of uh, isolated cowboy philosophy and, and, and more into something interactive where you're actually worrying and thinking all the time about how it's going to be used, that's going to make you much more <clears throat> valuable in the marketplace. And I think one thing that's important to think about is you always have to worry about the kind of data that end users are going to give you. Uh, uh, I, I think a typical programmer will often think what end users will throw at you, <laughs> but it's very important that as it gets thrown to you, you need to be ready to catch it, if, if you know what I'm, uh, I'm saying. So here's some general tips as a web developer. First of all, uh, Stephen, I, I think it's safe to say you need to learn multiple languages. Um, I think most of us on the call will probably understand that that there's some form of gateway drug language that people will learn their programming on, right? Um, and I think that right now that best gateway drug is JavaScript. What do you think, Stephen? Isn't that I, pretty much? I pretty agree with you, James. And people that yeah. I talk with also have that 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 same type of feeling, because if you can get in there and even learning HTML and then moving into JavaScript, and then moving into other languages, the learning curve on learning other languages seems to go down because coding in JavaScript or, or, or learning the rules of JavaScript uh, is, is very similar to other languages. And so once you, once you have that down, and, and you've, you've alluded to that before in the presentation, but the, the more uh, you understand a single language, the more it carries over into, into other languages. I agree, and, and so as a programmer, you'll start with some early language, and JavaScript is a nice one. It's not the perfect one, but it has so many uses. I mean, it's the kind of the ultimate uh, scripting language because uh, it has so many functions. But as you learn multiple languages, you'll have to learn 
that you have to choose wisely. And I'm, I'm using, a, a, you'll notice these uh, images here are from, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, well, I think it's the third Indiana Jones movie, the, the Last Crusade, the one where they go after the Holy Grail. If you don't choose wisely, as a developer, something will happen to you similar to uh, that, that guy who gets all you know, wrecked. <laughs> he chose the wrong uh, cup. He chose, <laughs> yeah, he chose the wrong cup. And if you choose the wrong language cup, right, um, to uh, in a particular situation, because well, I I'm a PHP developer and that's all I really want to work with today. You're going to end up putting that, you know, what is it? How do you put it? Uh, a square peg into a round hole, or you're not going to choose wisely, and you will run into problems. PHP is often used to identify in in a website because it is um, very good. At, uh, at being uh, kind of like the uh, uh, Perl's kind of the duct tape out there of, of languages. But PHP is very good at, um, at creating quick applications uh, that are very functional. And a lot of people will do this because you can quickly develop and, um, and solve particular problems on a site. Perl's good at grabbing data, and you can parse that data. Uh, and it's also very good for cross-platform uh, compatibility. And don't get me wrong, all of these can do this. But they all have strengths. Um, if you want to create heavy-duty server-side and even client-side apps, Java is, is very good. Uh, there are, of course, frameworks that are available. But make sure you choose wisely or you're going to end up in, in problems even worse than that, our friend here in that Indiana Jones movie. Your job is to think as a person, not as a programmer in some cases. Listen to input. You create project plans, usually with people, uh, with project managers. You solve problems. You establish business goals or, let's put it this way, you create code that has business goals, and then you use technology to help your business work. That's a different mindset than, I'm going to create really cool code. Uh, those two can come together, and, and that's, when, that's when you've really done a, a nice job as a developer. But as long as your code uh, is cool and establishes or focuses on business goals, that's where you're going to be successful. So think like your audience. Think of demographics, gender, and company cultures. Another uh, tip that uh, I've noticed, and this one is uh, from Dave Child, who is being very sardonic. Um, he basically is saying, you are responsible for processing data. And that data is going to come in at you in a million different ways. And the more quickly you can learn to receive it and process it, and as Stephen, as you put it, process it, uh, fold, send it, and mutilate it right in the right way, the more you can do that, you'll be very valuable. But the cardinal rule is you can't really trust that data as it comes in. And by data, uh, never, ever trust your uh, end users. Every piece of data your site collects contains malicious code. Assume that. And he's being a little sardonic, but he's got a really good point. That means that you better start validating data, data and validating code and input, uh, making sure that you uh, run all sorts of checks. Because if you don't, you could end up creating an application that draws in, collects, and executes bad code. And then you have uh, a security issue. Always comment your code, as I said. If you're hit by a truck or even worse, out on vacation, if you haven't been commenting your code and leaving notes, uh, people won't know what your intentions were. People won't know how to resolve them. So that's another tip that's very important. It also helps yourself when you come back and, you know, if you've been away from a project for a few months and you come back and you say, what was I doing? <laughs> Why did I do that? It helps to have a point. note to yourself. No, good for you. I, I, that's funny because I think a lot of people assume that, well, when you start a project, you're going to continue working on it from start to finish. Well, uh, the world is uh, often not that way, is it? Right? You, you, you will be put on other uh, other projects, and so you'll have to refresh yourself and comment in many directions. You do that. Yeah. So as you develop for desktops and servers, I've talked a bit about uh, mobile development, but understand that you know cross-platform languages might be the best things to start talking about. Interpreted PHP, Python, and Perl are great ways to go. Uh, if you go into a Windows shop only, well, .NET is a great way to go. But again, uh, not everybody has the luxury of saying, well, I'm going to stay in a Windows shop for the rest of my career. So uh, multiple languages and multiple platforms are your best bet. Databases are going to be very important for you to understand. You need to know your SQL. If you don't know how to create SQL and understand the relationships uh, involved, um, you as a developer will be severely limited. So understand 
your SQL, and also how various databases work, from Oracle, IBM, the proprietary ones, to the open source one, PostgreSQL, and MySQL, which is now owned by Oracle, ironically enough. So as you move into actual programming languages, people, I think one thing to think about <clears throat> is, uh, and here's Rodan Thinker, if you, you'll see it here, the image here, there you go. Uh, some key considerations will be, well, how well does the language teach you essential constructs? How easy is it to learn? These are things that you'll be asking yourself. Also think about, for the, about the demand for the language in the marketplace. Uh, JavaScript is a great way to start. PHP is a great way to start. Um, Python is also uh, very nice, uh, the simplicity of it. And people can get up to speed very quickly with Python, very nice language. But JavaScript is really uh, the one that you want to start with because you can start creating, as a web designer, you can start moving into a developer with that language very nicely. So it's all about the application. PHP, uh, relatively easy, easy to learn in terms of Java. It's matured nicely. Uh, Perl is great for pattern matching. Uh, it's fallen more and more out of favor, but it's still something that has a huge install base. Uh, there's Python and Ruby. Uh, Python uh, is great because it was kind of built from the ground up, so it's less workaround oriented than PHP and Perl. In other words, Perl and PHP, they learned along the way, and they created workarounds for the entire language. But Python was created a little bit more from the ground up, so there are fewer workarounds. Uh, YouTube, for example, and many other companies use uh, Python for their server-side programming. There's also Ruby on Rails. That's supposed to be an S there, Ruby on Rails. It's also built from the ground up, very object-oriented, and the Django project is designed to make Ruby on Rails much uh, as powerful, let's say, maybe as Java, but with a less of an uh, overhead in terms of having to learn it as a language. And of course, JavaScript. Uh, if it might be a car or maybe a great one-ton pickup or PHP is a great SUV. Well, Java is like an 18-wheel semi-truck. It's a very heavy-duty programming uh, uh, language. It fell out of favor for a while in a certain sense, but it has uh, come back big time. And so there's a URL here that you can look on at your, uh, at your leisure. I've also uh, provided some resources uh, uh, that Steve and I would be happy to talk with you about at, at any given time. Uh, point if you have any questions. These are resources that we that I grabbed off the uh, uh, web that talk about what every designer should learn starting out as a developer and techniques that developers should know. Uh, there's also here on this the next screen as it comes up talking about languages that every developer should know and what every well web developer needs to know. And so as you want to become a programmer, here are things that you can learn online uh, even. Uh, so there are a lot of resources that we've uh, made available uh, for you that you can go and check out. But understand, when it comes to CIW, uh, we teach web development to you today. So if you are that rugged individualist learner who can learn by yourself, congratulations. I've found that most people need a lot of mentoring and a lot of help from their instructors. And that's why CIW exists, because we have a foundations program that teaches you the whole Internet. So a lot of people, a lot of people want to just say, well, yeah, the the foundations course or certification site development is the one that we'll talk about. Well, actually, you need all three. Is that fair enough to say, Stephen? Don't you need a proper foundation in all of the internet, not just in design and programming? It is definitely going to be a benefit, especially if you're trying to make or develop develop applications that are going to run on the internet, you have to understand how it works, how people use it, how we access information, how it gets from point A to point B. And so after you've taken foundations, and here's where all of what IBA contains. IBA contains all of the elements that you're going to need to know for every application used on the internet and the web today. Site Development Associate is your beginning, right, of HTML, understanding HTML5 and how to create images and all that. And it, all of these, that it does more than that. It sets the, the uh, it sets the foundation for you for understanding what it means to be a developer, because it goes right into it and, and understanding things like JavaScript and how all of the languages work. Network Technology Associate gives you the networking knowledge that you need so that you can then move in to the CIW Web Development Series of courses, which have JavaScript specialists, database design, and Perl right now. So JavaScript. 
uh, the course focuses on the kinds of knowledge that you need to know to create sophisticated JavaScript applications, from cookies to declaring variable, from declaring variables to cookies to AJAX to working with the document object model. It's all there. We also have the database design specialist certification that does a great job explaining how you can create SQL statements and how you can design databases as a developer and design them so that they work well. We even have a security certification so that you can secure everything that you've created. So um, what I want to emphasize is the importance of how at CIW we have a turnkey modular approach. Uh, we provide courseware, we provide assessment and supplement, and uh, that way you have a full program that is industry, uh, industry respected. Uh, uh, what you can do, folks, is follow CIW today. Uh, we gave uh, uh, Stephen's uh, Twitter URL. Stephen, what is that URL again? You can say it out loud to everybody. Uh, CIW underscore instructor. Thank you. And you can go to Twitter.com, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube to learn more. And of course, you can contact uh, uh, me, and I'll, I'll make sure to forward every question over to Stephen so he can answer it. Next. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so you can uh, contact us uh, today. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, we've gone a bit over time, but uh, what kind of questions do folks have, uh, uh, Lisa? There was one interesting question about someone uh, who's someone who uh, Jennifer Erie is in health informatics, learning both back end of electronic medical record software and something for CIW, she wants to know if there's, you know, a connection between the two or uh, she says, you know, when does the language transfer from one to the other? You bet. When it comes to health informatics, what'll, there are a couple of things. First of all, some of the applications, uh, some of the servers and that you will be working with, health informatics servers will often have APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, ready-made to work with various languages. Sometimes that uh, the server that you're working with will want a specific language and really will only want to work with, let's say, Java. But usually they're fairly universal. And so uh, the language that, languages that you'll often see interfacing with health informatics will be uh, Java, a little bit of PHP. And uh, so I'll go ahead and conclude uh, uh, this particular uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Right. Hey, Bye, thanks, everyone. Lisa. Thanks, Stephen.